Good afternoon, Dr. Nick Coatsworth with today's update on coronavirus disease across the nation. The total number of cases diagnosed so far of COVID-19 is 20,698 with 40, 475 newly confirmed cases to 12 noon today. Uh, in New South Wales, there were nine new cases, two were overseas acquired, four were locally acquired and contacts of a confirmed case and three were locally acquired, a contact has not yet been identified and is still under investigation. Victoria today reported 466 new cases, 24 were locally acquired and contacts of a confirmed case and 442 remain under investigation. The total number of people who have died in Australia to date of COVID-19 is 278 and 12 new deaths occurred uh, to 12 noon today. There are 8,100 active cases, 659 people are hospitalised with COVID-19 and 53 of those are in intensive care. I wanted to reflect again today on the uh, extent of the Commonwealth support to Victoria. Um, indeed, um, the support that we're giving is very, very wide ranging and there is um, an open book of support um, for our colleagues down in Victoria. But one of the specific things that I saw today as I went for my office, from my office in uh, Scarborough House down here, I'm on the same floor as the contact tracers who are assisting uh, with the Victorian response. Over the past week, I've had a number of discussions with some of our most senior epidemiologists in the country who are supporting the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre and their epidemic intelligence unit down there. I've uh, spoken directly uh, with my colleagues in Victoria uh, on a number of occasions to push forward an agenda to get more data on healthcare worker infection. On that point in particular, the numbers today regarding the numbers of healthcare workers and residential aged care workers who have acquired COVID-19 are, are of significant concern to all of us. And I wanted to reflect on how that makes people feel when they are going to work in a healthcare or residential aged care setting in that environment. And to do so by means of a uh, personal story, I, uh, as uh, some of you will know, worked for Médecins Sans Frontières or Doctors Without Borders uh, in uh, the 2000s. And one of those uh, missions was to uh, the Republic of Sudan, uh, which was a, a challenging environment then. But what it exposed me to was that feeling of constant risk, that feeling of anxiety, of not knowing what the day would hold, uh, or indeed of uh, what personal risk I was, uh, I was going to find myself in. And that takes its toll, of course. And we know um, that that is taking its toll on our colleagues down in Victoria at the moment. Uh, I know that feeling of not being able to sleep particularly well, of getting up in the morning, not feeling at all refreshed. Um, I know that feeling uh, of concern, moving to anxiety, moving to something that um, can be constantly there and stay there for a long time. And so what I would strongly encourage um, all Victorians to do, if that is not reason enough uh, to uh, support the stage four restrictions, do everything that you possibly can to bring these numbers down. For healthcare workers and residential aged care workers, my colleagues down in Victoria, please avail yourself uh, of assistance if you're feeling that way. Um, whether that is formal assistance, often through your general practitioner, um, whether that is going to the Black Dog Institute and going to the 10 website, uh, which is a particularly good resource, whether that is talking to colleagues. And if you're a member of a healthcare worker's family um, or you're the friend of a healthcare worker, um, do what I've done this week and just pick up the phone to those who have been and are still on the front line down there. And just check in on how they're going because I can tell you that from the feedback that I've received uh, this week, that is a really, really important intervention. Um, just that one-on-one -on -one, uh, shows, show, showing your support um, for them and reminding us again that the best way that we can get show healthcare workers in this nation our support is by be taking that curve that seems to be flat at the moment and bending it down uh, so uh, we get this epidemic in Victoria under control. And I think I've got one question on the phone. I'll pick it up. Dr. Coatesworth, 
Thomas, Andrew Green from the ABC. Go ahead, Andrew. Can I just ask on New South Wales, there are nine infections, as you say, uh, where the source is unknown this week. Why are those cases more concerning than the ones connected to known clusters? And do you believe that there could be some complacency creeping in at New South Wales? Well, any time we see cases that can't be linked to an existing outbreak, uh, they create concern because there must, by definition, be something going on uh, in the community that public health authorities aren't aware of. So the way that they try and track things down, of course, is to look for upstream contacts. Uh, so during your contact tracing interview, when you're a confirmed case of COVID-19, uh, the public health authorities will ask who you've been in, in contact with in the previous uh, uh, 14 days. And, and that might help identify the chain of transmission. If it doesn't, uh, and there are unknown chains of transmission, um, then that's when the testing comes into its own and widespread testing in the geographic area around where that person was diagnosed and where they have been is how you might uncover uh, the, the chain of transmission. Once you've found that, you can be a lot more comfortable and that you know where COVID is, uh, who's got it and what you're going to do about it. In terms of complacency, I think we, um, we all as Australians have to have an eye down to Victoria, both in terms of support, of course, uh, but also in terms of what could happen in our own backyards. And so um, whilst it's important uh, for people to feel that their lives are back to the new normal, it's critically important that we're not going back to the old normal, uh, which means that we have to maintain social distancing. That means we have to maintain excellent hygiene. We have to get tested whenever we are unwell with any of those respiratory symptoms, cough, cold, sore throat. All those things uh, have to be in place. And to be honest, I think at the, in this day and age, the actual idea of, uh, of attending um, multiple venues on one night, um, people need to reflect on whether that is the right thing to do. Uh, you know, we were all, we were all 20 once. Um, and there will be um, people who remain in their 20s after that pandemic when this is all over, who can go back to the old, um, you know, eight pub pub crawl. But uh, for the moment, I think um, we need to kind of push, pull, pull back a little bit on our, uh, on our socialising. And I think just remember that when you visit um, many places in a night, uh, that, that could well be. You, you may be the person spreading the virus or you're putting yourself at risk of getting it. And I'll take one more if you've got it, because... Uh... Yeah. OK. Talking to healthcare workers. Yes. Can I just ask, uh, why did the infection control expert group, which advises the government on masks, stop short of recommending P2 type masks for all healthcare workers treating COVID-19 patients? Well, look, I, I, what a... Just uh, clarify that, the infection control expert group uh, didn't stop short. Uh, the, uh, the ICAG has reviewed their guidance on P2 N95 masks and broadened it to include uh, situations, largely hospital-based situations, where uh, the, either the behaviour of the patient is un unpredictable or the setting is unpredictable. The patient may deteriorate quickly, the patient may be on high flow oxygen. The situation may be in the emergency department where it's not particularly clear who has COVID or who hasn't. So there has been a broad expansion, in fact, of the indications for P2 mask use. And I think it's an appropriate time to reflect on why and how that has come, out, come about. The infection control expert group is, uh, comprises our leading infection control practitioners uh, across the country, um, people who have been doing this for decades of their lives. They are um, the experts in interpreting the evidence, in making um, policy decisions and recommendations. But they're also the experts in investigating and uncovering uh, why these transmissions may have occurred. And I can tell you that I've been in personal communication with, uh, with the Victorian Chief Medical Officer in the past weeks, uh, and uh, that, uh, amongst other things, has led to a significant change in Victoria's P2 uh, N95 mask policy. And the, uh, the uh, expansion of P2N95 use that ICAG uh, has recommended as of yesterday came through direct discussions between the chair of ICAG, um, senior infection control practitioners in Victoria, 
and on-the-ground infectious disease physicians who had investigated uh, certain transmission events, certain healthcare worker cases, where standard guidelines-based um, and surgical mask um, PPE was used. Uh, so this has been a direct result of on-the-ground frontline communication um, to ICAG, and that's why um, the adjustment has occurred. And I think we might wrap up there for today. Thanks very much.